Hello, welcome to everyone. We're going to be get, getting started in just a few minutes. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're going to be getting started in just a few minutes. We will be taking uh, questions via chat this evening. So throughout the duration of the program, if you would like to share questions, comments, you can do so in the chat. And we'll be getting started at 7.05. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us. We'll be getting started in about two minutes. And if you'd like to share in the chat where you're coming from tonight and how you heard about tonight's program, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks again for coming in tonight. We will be getting started in just about one minute and I'll be introducing you to our panelists this evening. So it's 7.05 and we're getting started. And we have a wonderful set of presenters this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. We're all here in Philadelphia. Um, and this 
event is part of a series that I've been able to put together um, on behalf of the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Susanna. And um, it highlights the Medieval Life exhibit, which is currently available online at freelibrary.org backslash exhibitions. And um, that work is really highlighting manuscripts that we have in our collections that are from the Middle Ages, as well as from area institutions. And this is a really wonderful partnership. And the exhibit was curated by Dot Porter, who's joining us here tonight. Dot, could you tell us a little bit more about the exhibit? Yes, I will. And I have a little uh, couple of slides that I will share with you here. So the exhibition is actually installed in the in the gallery at the Free Library. You can see I'm not actually in the gallery, but I have it as my background here. It's um, a gorgeous exhibition. Um, it's unclear if it will ever open before it has to close um, and all of the um, manuscripts go back to their libraries. But I've been to see it and it's gorgeous. The, the folks at the Free Library did a really wonderful job with the design. Um, so the Medieval Life Exhibition um, was, um, the, the idea of it came out of a project that we had in Philadelphia through the Philadelphia Area Consortium of Special Collections Libraries or PACSCL to digitize the medieval manuscripts in Philadelphia. Um, and this was a three-year project that finished last year and we ended up digitizing 475 codices codices being books that are in the, in the form of books, uh, plus um, a large number of leaves and cuttings. So things that have been cut out of books or leaves that fell out of books that we happen to have. Um, and so as sort of a celebration of that, uh, the Free Library um, invited me to come and um, put together an exhibition uh, related to the manuscripts, but not just about the manuscripts. And so we came up with the concept of medieval life. The, the exhibition itself is divided into five sections. The five sections being family, labor, law and justice, religion, and the natural world. And what I did is I looked in at all of the manuscripts that we had digitized as part of medieval life, um, or sorry, part of um, the Bibliotheca Philadelphiensis project, which was the name of the project. Um, and divided them into these groups and then thought about how we could look at the, the manuscripts and the, the information that we were learning from the manuscripts in a way that would bring the Middle Ages closer to us, as opposed to sort of looking um, askance and saying the medieval people were very different and far away from us. If we could turn it around and say, they, there are things that we can see ourselves in, in the way that they lived. Um, still acknowledging, of course, that, that life was very different in the Middle Ages. Um, and so in each section, there are a number of manuscripts and there are also other things that, um, that are from our own time that we can sort of use to think about how we are in some ways like people were um, in the Middle Ages in our lived lives. And um, after the main uh, presentation, I will show you some manuscripts and we'll talk a little bit uh, more about that. But I think that's enough about the exhibition for now. And I want to turn it over to Angie and Marissa uh, for their presentations. Um, and I have Angie's um, uh, slides. So I'm going to unshare and then I'm going to reshare if I can find. Let's see. Uh, Dot, I think Marissa's oh. slide goes on first. Oh, are you going to go first, Marissa? Yeah. Okay. Thank Let me you know so when. Marissa, could you tell us a little bit more about where you're coming from? Thank you so much for presenting tonight. Sure. I'm um, an assistant professor of Renaissance literature at Penn State University's Abington College, um, which is in the northern suburbs of Philly. Um, but I'm joining you today from my South Philadelphia home. Um, I've been working with historical recipes on my cooking in the archives project for the last six years. Okay, well, I'm going to also show you a PowerPoint. Uh, so let me get it ready to go here. 
Thank you. And while Marissa is setting all of that up, I just wanted to let you know that along with the Zoom link, you should have received tonight's recipe. So for those of you that might be following along and preparing the recipe, you can pull that up as well. Thank you. So thank you everyone for coming out tonight. I'm gonna to talk about the recipe that's on this slide, which is entitled Instructions to Make Cakes. So these cakes are made from flour, butter, sugar, and cloves. And they're actually much more like a shortbread cookie than um, what you might think of as cake, something that's fluffy and, and aerated. These are, are much denser and more like a um, cookie. So in my Cooking in the Archives project, I locate recipes like this one in library collections, transcribe them by typing out the old forms of cursive handwriting, uh, conduct research on the ingredients and methods um, in the original manuscript, and also prepare these recipes in my home kitchen in Philly and share updated recipes and informational blog posts on my site. Um, this means that these recipes are ready for readers to use in their own home kitchens. But before I walk us through the steps of preparing this recipe, I'm going to talk about a few things I've learned in the course of researching both this specific recipe um, and my work on historical recipes in general. So questions like, where did this recipe come from? Why does it look the way it does? What is the significance of the spices used in this particular recipe? And what is the significance of spices in medieval and Renaissance cooking and in global history? So first, where did this recipe come from and why does it look the way it does? So this instructions to make cakes recipe is from a 16th century English manuscript. And manuscript means that it's handwritten, written by hand. And um, this particular style of handwriting is called secretary hand. And it's a dominant form of Renaissance handwriting that has very different letter forms than the modern, um, modern handwriting you might use to write cursive, to sign a check or something like that. But handwriting is something you might still associate with recipes. You might exchange recipes with other people on recipe cards. You might make notes in your um, cookbooks about things that went wrong or things that went right. Um, I personally keep uh, recipes in a um, manuscript. This is one of my um, how like my own recipe books. It has recipes here from my mom um, that I've written down and use in my own home kitchen. So this re practice of writing down recipes and keeping them together in a book um, was a dominant practice in earlier periods, but it's also something that connects to the way we still keep track of recipes today. So uh, I'm using the terms recipe book, manuscript cookbooks, and receipt book. It's all to refer to the same category of manuscripts that were widely used in England, in Europe, and the Americas and connect to forms that we still use today. So um, I'm gonna turn away from this particular manuscript to another one because I think this page really nicely demonstrates some characteristics of recipe books. So this is a page of University of Pennsylvania Manuscript Codex 252. Um, the top image is an opening or two pages of that manuscript together. And it, um, it's from about 1600, was used in the 17th century. So a little bit later again than um, the recipe for cakes, but it really shows the diversity of material in the, these books. So there's a recipe here to make collar beef, um, a second recipe, a cure for a cold, a third recipe, another receipt for making plague water. So we have two recipes for medicine and one recipe for food, all kind of grouped together. Also on the bottom image from the same manuscript, there's a small recipe to fry oysters. And this recipe used to be affixed with pins to the manuscript. And you can actually see the holes still where I'm moving my cursor. Um, and this, practice of attaching small slips of paper with additional recipes with uh, pins, metal pins, or sewing them in was a common practice to add into your recipe manuscript. 
these recipes also show that recipes are usually narrative paragraphs instead of the modern scientific recipe that begins with ingredients and precise amounts and then followed by methods. Now, the, another receipt to make plague water actually um, is an exception that proves the rule. It has a list of ingredients at the top, including wormwood, uh, marigold, sorrel, rue, balm, sage. And it says in the instructions, you would use a pound of each of those. But again, it's not quite what you might look, you might see if you picked up um, a cookbook or if you looked at allrecipes.com. Um, this spread also demonstrates that recipes um, for food and medicine are not really separated out or considered separate categories. And that's because humoral theory governed medicinal and um, culinary thinking in the medieval and Renaissance period. In fact, the physicians um, in these periods were looking back to the work of Hippocrates and Galen in the ancient world. In humoral medicine, um, there were four substances in the bodies, the four humors, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And the balance of those humors within the body determined physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. So whatever you ingested, be it food, or what we would call it food or medicine, um, how you exercised, how you slept, how your emotions were regulated, all could impact your humoral balance and your overall health or um, illness. So recipe books were the household repository of, mu of culinary and medicinal knowledge. Members of the household would either collect recipes from their social networks, their friends, their relatives, their neighbors um, in advance of an issue or, um, or when there was an issue at hand. So on the one hand, you want to have a cure ready in, so, in case someone gets a cold, or you want to have a pickle recipe for the cucumbers that you're growing in your garden. Alternatively, you might be in immediate need. Someone in your household is sick and you think they're sick with a cold and you want medicine to help heal them. Um, or your cucumbers are ripe and you need to pickle them as soon as possible, right? So you go to your social network to get cures um, and to um, find recipes to use to solve your problem. Um, and this information I'm drawing from Elaine Long's book, Recipes and Everyday Knowledge, where she shows how the whole family, servants working in the household, and the larger social network of communities were all involved in gathering and recording this type of information for the household. These kinds of manuscripts could be small or large. They um, could fit in the hand or they could be really um, um, big and you'd wonder how they'd be propped open in different situations. They could be written in beautiful handwriting with calligraphic flourishes, sometimes uh, special red ink contrasting with the normal brown iron gall ink. And um, sometimes they're a total mess, super messy, difficult to read, stained in places, heavily used. Um, sometimes a recipe book will be complete It'll be full from the first pages to the last pages with material. And sometimes someone had big plans and started strong, but never finished. So sometimes you'll have a small section of recipes and then a, pretty much a blank book that never got filled out. These manuscripts were sometimes used for 100 years within a particular family or a household with each generation making comments, adding new recipes and passing down traditions. Instructions to make cakes is from University of Pennsylvania Manuscript Codex 823. It was created and used, um, this manuscript was created and used from approximately six, uh, 1567 to 1600. And it is only partly a recipe book. Um, there's a final section of medicinal and culinary recipes that come at the end after pages of Psalms copied from the Bible or a prayer book and a copy of the deathbed statement of Lady Catherine Gray. So these were devotional religious materials. And although the manuscript is miscellaneous, the recipe section is a familiar blend of medicinal and culinary preparations with a focus on um, preserving fresh foods. 
So the page on the slide includes the recipe for cakes that we're, we're getting to eventually, um, as well as recipes to make vinegar, to preserve pears and barberries, and to prepare white pot, which is similar to bread pudding in this particular um, version of it. These materials I've talked about so far are later than the manuscripts and the materials in medieval life, um, the exhibition. But food trends in recipe books are retrospective rather than primarily forward looking. They maintain traditions and slowly integrate new things, new recipes from the social network, new ingredients arriving in Europe from the Americas after 1492. So you can think about it this way. Um, you may have a favorite holiday recipe that people in your family have made for years. Maybe it's 20 years. 50 years, 100 years that they've used this recipe to make this special dish. But you likely also have newer additions, some, something someone tried one year and everyone liked it, or a recipe that someone who joined your family brought to a holiday and now it's part of the tradition. So it's more um, accumulating new knowledge and new um, recipes than um, throwing out the old uh, wholesale in this period. Now that I've um, talked about manuscript recipe books, I'm going to turn my attention to spices. Medieval and Renaissance European cooking was heavily spiced. Until fashions changed in the 18th century, wealthy and aspirational households used spices imported from Asia in all sorts of sweets and savory dishes. The international spice trade goes back to the ancient world and cooks in Europe flavored dishes with black pepper, nutmeg, cinnamon, ginger, and the spice that flavors this dish, cloves. And there's a widespread myth that Renaissance and medieval cooks use spices to disguise the bad flavors of rotten beet, but this is categorically false. There is no evidence of cooks doing this and it doesn't make any financial sense or um, chemical sense. So financially, Meat is far cheaper than spices. So you wouldn't waste precious spices to season bad meat. And um, chemically, spices do have preservative powers, but it would be far more effective for cooks to salt, smoke, air dry, or store meat in, um, under oil than to rely on spices alone to prevent spoilage. So there, if you have some meat that you're worried about, you have there are many better things to do than to use very expensive spices on something that might not um, be safe to eat or taste good. Uh, cloves, um, and I have some, some whole cloves here to hand, um, uh, were especially prized in medieval and Renaissance kitchens because of um, their unique floral flavor and wonderful scent. In Out of the East, Spices and the Medieval Imagination, a book that has informed many of my remarks tonight, Paul Friedman shows that medieval scholars wrote about the origin of clove trees in the Garden of Eden because of their heavenly smell. Cloves were imported to England and purchased in huge quantities for use in medicines and cookery. In some recipes, they were used as an aphrodisiac because they would heat the body and ingest a humoral imbalance that was causing an issue. And they were also used as a treatment for dental problems. Cloves were in such high demand in Europe that fake cloves were a problem in the market. Vinegar and ground cloves would be like kind of mixed together and put on inferior cloves um, or cloves mixed with other materials to make a fake clove. Overall, cloves were valued for their scent, their culinary qualities, and their healing properties. The desire for spices and their cost motivated European exploration. Expeditions sailed across the Atlantic Ocean in search of a shortcut to Asia, and ships also sailed south and east along known routes. Portuguese ships were specifically sent to target the port of Malacca in 1511 and the Clove Island of Ternate in 1513. Tomé Piers, a pharmacist and diplomat wrote, whoever holds Malacca has his hand on the throat of Venice and consequently control of the global spice trade. 
While the Venetian spice trade and the overland routes survived the Portuguese conquest of Malacca, European desire for spices nevertheless drove colonial and imperial ventures. The recipe to make cakes is from the decades immediately following the European conquest of the South Asian spice islands. The recipe calls for IID cloves. So in Roman numerals, this is two D cloves and D is the abbreviation for pennies or pence. So the recipe calls for two pennies worth of cloves and thus demonstrates the connection between the price of spices in the market and the measurement of spices for use in recipes. So working with some historical spice prices, I believe that the original recipe for cakes calls for six whole cloves, which would have cost two pence. For comparison, in the 16th century, a loaf of bread cost a penny and bread provided far more sustenance than a few cloves. Um, in my updated recipe, I've quartered um, the recipe from the original and use the equivalent of 1.5 cloves to flavor a dozen cookies. And you can do this either by using some ground cloves or by grinding your own. So even though the original recipe calls for expensive cloves, cloves it uses them sparingly and in balance with other flavors and ingredients. The sugar in these cookies would also have been imported and far more expensive than the flour and butter called for in the recipe. But a little bit of clove goes a long way, as anyone who has prepared modern recipes with cloves uh, can tell you well. So here again is the um, image of the recipe from the manuscript. And now I'm going to read you my transcription of this um, secretary handwriting. Okay. Instructions to make cakes. First, take a quart of fine flour a pound of sugar, two pence of cloves, finely beaten, a uh, fine beaten, and thereunto put a pound of sweet butter, and then work it together until such time as you shall think it well wrought. And so make it in cakes and put it into the oven where manchet or cakes hath been baked immediately after the same is drawn. And you might note that the baking of fine cakes that to the baking of fine cakes, a temperate heat might be in the oven and you might not suffer them to stand in the oven till they be brown because they might harden and wax brown when they be brown after they have stand a while. So I've already discussed the ingredients in this recipe, but I want to point out the instructions here for the cook. These instructions tell a hearth cook exactly how to control a fire for these cakes. So first the cook would bake their manchette or like a light white bread um, or maybe other cakes and then take those things out of the oven. Then they would put these cakes into the oven. And at the end here, the instructions are telling the cook not to let the cakes bake too long and become too brown because it might make them harden um, and um, not an ideal color for serving. So these instructions helped inform my choice of an oven temperature, um, even though I'm of course cooking in a very different me, uh, mode and context than um, this original recipe. But it does tell us um, some things about how hearth cooks were thinking about fire um, and how they were thinking about managing heat. So um, here is the modern recipe and I'm going to walk you through how you might make this. I know some of you might be baking along at home. Um, I'm going to go a little too fast <laughs> if you're working on it at home, but hopefully this will help. Okay, so I've quartered the original recipe, which makes about a dozen cookies, a pretty manageable amount. And um, they look like this when they're done, a nice golden color. Uh, the recipe calls for a half a cup of sugar, eight tablespoons of butter or one stick at room temperature, a cup of flour, an eighth of a teaspoon of ground cloves, or this would be 1.5 cloves that you've ground yourself, um, freshly ground. Um, some additional butter or um, baking spray for the baking sheet, maybe some baking parchment if that's how you wanna do it. So if you're baking these, you would start by preheating your oven to 275 Fahrenheit, preparing your baking sheet with your spray, your butter, your baking parchment. The next step would be to cream together the butter and sugar 
until it is pale and fluffy. You can do this with a spoon um, in your bowl, or you can do this with a mixer, whatever works best for you. Okay. And then you add the flour and the cloves to the mixture to form a workable dough. It will be crumbly, but it will hold together when pressed. So it, I have some here. It is very, very crumbly, okay? Like would crumble apart in my hands over my computer. Um, but when pressed, it does start to hold together and will hold together into a cookie shape. So don't worry when you're making these if your dough is really, really crumbly, as long as you get it together into a shape on the um, baking sheet, it will work. So I rolled my dough into a log and sliced it to make cookies that looked like this when they were baked. I also um, kind of pushed some into like flat ovals and that came out like this with a little bit lacier edges here than the, uh, than the more slice and bake um, version. And I also um, free, uh, shaped a log and froze some of the dough and used it later. Um, and that worked out really nicely. So you could always make a couple cookies at a time or you could double the recipe and, and freeze some. That's a nice option with this dough. So um, I, once your oven's preheated, you've got your dough shaped, you can bake these for 30 to 35 minutes until just firm, but still tender. They'll still be a little tender if you poke them. And you, I like to allow them to cool for a few minutes on the baking sheet before um, moving them so they can kind of set up and um, establish themselves. So um, that's what I've got for um, information behind the uh, recipe. You should have received it in your email and I welcome you to cook it and to let me know how it goes. I've put my contact information and information about cooking in the archives up here on the slide. Um, by my count today, uh, there are more than 100 updated recipes um, from historical manuscripts there. So uh, thank you so much. Happy baking. And I'm going to turn things over to Angie. Thank you, Marissa. And as Angie is just getting set up and Dot is going to be pulling up her PowerPoint, um, Marissa, if you have a moment, there is a question about the cookie dough. Uh, we have a, an attendee who's wondering, is it essentially like a shortbread? Yes, it's like a shortbread. Okay, um, perfect. It's and like that in get texture. More into, oh, go ahead. Oh no, it's like that in texture when you're eating it. And it's like that with the very short crumbly dough when you're preparing. Perfect. And we'll have more time for Q&A as well. But if anyone else has questions, feel free to drop it in the chat. I want to turn it over to Angie, who I have the pleasure of working with again on this program. Angie, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're coming from tonight? Yes. Um, so my name is Angie Branca. I am a chef and an owner of a Malaysian restaurant in South Philadelphia, or used to be in South Philadelphia, but we closed during COVID, unfortunately. Um, I am from Malaysia, and I grew up about 60 miles from the port of Malacca, that port that Marissa just spoke about where it was the hub of the spice trade. So what I'm gonna go through today in my slides is to, um, to share the story of what these times were halfway around the world and how cloves affected life halfway around the world in Southeast Asia and what happened at the same period of time that Marissa discussed about and the same period that that uh, exhibition displays um, halfway around the world, there is so much happening there that really dictate the world that we live in today. Um, and of course, you know, it's all gonna be centered around clothes and food obviously since I'm a chef. So it's, it's always gonna be around food. Um, so let's go to the first slide. For those of you who are not sure where Malacca is, this is an old map. And this is the map of the Spice Islands. The Spice Islands is right here in the middle. And if you see, um, you could probably make out the shape of where Philippines is. 
And at the bottom left corner, that's where the island of Indonesia is. And at the far right is Papua New Guinea. And at the top left corner, just on uh, above the blue line that I drew, that's the mainland from China down to Vietnam. And, at, and then uh, going around the bend, you would find a peninsula. And that's the peninsula of Malaya. Where the star is, that is the port of Malacca. So over 600 years ago, the port of Malacca was a, a thriving city that's on the west coast of this peninsula. And if you look at the location, it's in a very strategic location in the middle of the Straits. And that Straits is called the Straits of Malacca. Um, it's a small narrow Straits between the mainland, the peninsula and the main island of Sumatra in Indonesia. That Straits is critical during that period of time because in that part of the world, there are huge monsoon seasons. There are two major monsoon seasons, one that blows from the Northeast and the other one that blows from the Southwest. And they would blow, you know, two different times of the year. And those monsoons would cause a lot of um, ships to not be able to sail. But at that, in that strait, that strait is the only point in this entire spice region that is sheltered from the monsoons. And that's where the port of Malacca is. Hence, that became one of the most important ports for trading. The blue line that I drew is the line where the ships would sail from China along the coast. They used to hug the coast because back those days, the ships were not that big. They, they, don't, they, they won't withstand sailing out in the open sea too long. So they would typically hug the coast, stopping at most of the port towns because the voyages back then just takes a very long time that they would have to stop at the port towns along the coast and just you know um, uh, build up the supplies again and then continue the journey. And that was the, the, the beginning part of the, um, the sailing route um, that started back in the um, it's, it's actually started back in the 1400s. These trade routes were one of the very first sea routes that existed in that part of the world. And it started as early as 1400s during the Ming Emperor's uh, reign in China. And it was led by one of the Ming Emperor's imperial eunuch. Uh, his name was Zheng He. Um, or in some regions, uh, some translation uh, translates his name to Cheng Ho, which is uh, the same name in a different dialect of Chinese. And um, so let's move on to the next slide. So, so you know, when, when we talk about trading, um, sea trading at that point in the 1400s was a big deal all over the Spice region, because if you look at the map, it was... It, they're all islands, and and back those days, um, the main community, the, the main transportation between island to island, was on boats and ships, and the longest, the, the biggest boats that were built by China uh, by by the Chinese emperor at that time, um, were the ones to, that who were able to sail the furthest. But within that region. Um, a lot of the locals um, all over the archipelago area were selling back and forth trading goods and spices within that region. So by the time um, Zhang He found his way to the Southeast Asian region, he already discovered the locals trading spices all over the archipelago and, and, um, and actually you know, using the port of Malacca as one of the main uh, hubs for trading. And, and therefore, um, in the 1400s, when China discovered this, um, in the next slide, um, these are some of, by the way, these uh, pictures that you will see in the next few slides here are pictures from the Museum of the Port of Malacca. And, and it depicts um, the life that was 
at that point during that period of time between the 1400s to the 1500s. Um, so this picture here is the locals. This was the this was actually the costume museum part of it. And this was this is what the locals used to wear during that time, um, and and they were trading spices uh, within the the um, the islands um, in 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 uh, and and you know using Malacca as the hub. Uh, but on the next slide. Uh, that's a depiction of the trades when the Chinese started to come in with their ships and their goods. And here you would see some of the things that were exchanged for spices, things like porcelain, clay, peanuts was one of them, and spices was one of the, uh, the, the key ingredients that they wanted to take back. And of course, you know, um, Zheng, well, Zheng He, um, he was one of the main, um, the, the, the main um, uh, emperors, um, uh, uh, one of the main emperors, um, uh, man, uh, he's actually a eunuch from the, from the main emperor's um, reign, but he was one of the, the main person who expanded the trade all over that region and grew it not just from a local trade, but to a very global trade that spans from China to the Middle East. Um, Zhang He himself was actually a Muslim. He was a born Muslim. And therefore, being very diverse himself as a person, he was able to trade very well with the locals and also establish trade relationships with the Middle East. So he ended up establishing himself at the port of Malacca as one of the main um, traders between the East and the West. So with, within, um, within the 14th century, in the next slide, you'll see that um, the trade really has flourished. The port of Malacca at that point became one of the main, in fact, it was the main spice trading port and of course a trading port for everything in exchange of, uh, for spices uh, in that entire region. It was really um, an important place at that time. Um, and so of all the spices, one of the main important spices and of course you know we, we are looking at uh, a, a large variety of spices from cinnamon to styanese to cloves and even you know varieties of ginger and turmeric but um, if you go to the next slide for some reason one of the most important spices was the clove even within this southeast asian chinese trade and um, if all of you are familiar with the way Chinese associates herbs and food. Um, it's always through the eyes of food being medicine and food for health. And um, Chinese have documented almost every single ingredient that's beneficial to health in, in a whole series of books and logs called the traditional Chinese herbal medicine. And it's, it's a log that has been started since before Christ in different uh, forms of manuscript. But by the 1400s, if you look at most of the manuscripts for traditional Chinese medicine, you would suddenly see cloves included as part of that category of medicine. And if you look at this diagram, you will see right in the middle, top middle, those are cloves. And that would you know, you see all kinds of herbs around it, and then you will see cloves. And, and cloves um, in Chinese uh, traditional medicine is called ting hyang, which means, um, uh, or ting xiang, which means fragrant needle, directly translated. And it was um, in, in, in the manuscript, cloves, the properties of cloves was described as having a pungent and warm property. And, and it was associated to benefit the spleen, the stomach, and the kidney meridians. 
its function was to warm the spleen and the stomach. It was to cure nausea, vomiting, and it was to cure hiccups due to cold. And it works with the kidney and it cures impotence and it cures lumbar aches. So those were how clothes were described in traditional Chinese medicine. So while in Southeast Asia, the spices were used just commonly in a day-to-day -day food, cloves was also very highly priced uh, by, uh, by the, the Chinese as a medicine. And back those days, in, in fact, up to today, um, when Chinese purchase cloves, I still remember my grandmother when she buys cloves, um, she would go, first of all, to the Chinese doctor. And it was through the, a series of analysis on the body condition that he would prescribe a, a herbal uh, tonic with cloves in it. So you would buy cloves back in those days um, for the Chinese people, you would actually buy cloves from the Chinese doctor, very much unlike in Southeast Asia, where you would typically buy spices from the spice, um, the, the, the spice traders or the spice blenders. In the Chinese world, you would buy cloves specifically from the Chinese doctor because it was prescribed as medicine and it had to be weighed and measured based on how much your body needs to eat. So in the next slide, um, because cloves was such a, uh, had such a good warming property over time, sailors that brought these spices or carried these spices back and forth has discovered how important it is for them to actually eat it too because it was warming for the body. So um, recipes started to be developed that incorporated, cl incorporated cloves in Chinese medicine specifically for the sailors to eat so that they would, um, they would uh, um, heal their body after long voyages out in the ocean where you know, from the uh, traditional Chinese medicine concept, uh, the body would have become um, uh, yin uh, or too cold. So they need to balance it with herbs and spices to bring it back to a balanced um, condition so that they won't fall sick. So there are dishes like what you see here. This is a dish that is very popular all over the port town of Malaysia. Um, it's called pakute. It translates to pork bone tea. And it, it is a combination of Chinese spices, cinnamon, cloves, and star anise. Now the um, incorporation of cloves and star anise is uh, in, into these kind of herbal soups and tonics that we would eat uh, is, it, you would see that not just in the port town of, um, uh, uh, in, in Malaysia, but you will see that all along the coast um, for those uh, along the voyages that the ancient voyages where I drew the blue line. So if you look at um, this dish, which is from Malaysia that has cloves in it and compare it to um, uh, pho, for example, which is another port town, it also has cloves, dianese and cinnamon in it as well. And it was always made into a broth that we would eat either with rice or noodles because it was considered a tonic and it was considered good for the body. So ingredients like cloves always existed in these kind of forms like a broth or a soup or you know, a tonic um, that you would drink and or eat with, with, your, with your meal. And it always started in the port towns where the, the, the spice sea routes existed from the 1400s. And that's what I find really interesting because when you go further inland, you don't see recipes that had cloves in it as much as you would if you would, you would look at the port towns of um, in Vietnam, Hanoi, um, or even in Macau, 
um, and even in Taiwan has similar kind of broth and the pork tongues of Malaysia, you will see all these pork tongues with very similar recipes that included cloves in it. And that's because of that health benefit that's documented very clearly in the Chinese uh, traditional medicine for its warming properties to the body. So, so that was what um, life was back then and how clothes was incorporated into the daily life halfway around the world. But one of the most significant thing that really changed the world uh, to what we know of today, if we go to the next slide, um, like I mentioned, this port of Malacca uh, was at that time uh, in the 1400s, the most important port town for trading of all these spices. And, and by the end of the middle era, um, Europe has already got the win of it. Um, they have already started to uh, learn about that whole region and the port of Malacca. And although, although um, most of uh, throughout Europe um, in, in the middle ages, there are stories of, of that entire region. No one was able to uh, control the spice trade the way um, Venice controlled it in, in Europe. They had a handle over spice trade. So near the end of the 15th century, empires in Europe were just building ships because they knew that Venice had controlled not because they had access to the source, they just had access to the trading. It was the hub of the trade, uh, the, uh, it was the hub of trading in, in, in Europe. So empires at the end of the 15th century um, in Europe were then building ships because they wanted to sail to where the source of the spices were. Explorers started to venture further and further um, to the Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia region and discovered that the port of Malacca, uh, not only was it a strategic place for, for it to be the spice hub within Southeast Asia, it was also the gateway from the West. If they sailed across the Pacific, around the coast of South Africa, the, the, the um, Cape, uh, Cape of Good Hope, they would then reach India where they would find um, chilies. And that was one of the first spice ingredients that they would bring back during those voyages. But then when, um, so, but then in the um, uh, 14, um, the early 1400s, they discovered, I'm sorry, the early 1500s, um, the Portuguese were the ones who first discovered in their expedition that if they sailed further east um, from India, they would then reach the port of Malacca. And that was indeed the gateway to the entire access to the spice wall. So on April 1511, Alfonso de Albuquerque was asked to sail from Goa under the command of the Portuguese to conquer the port of Malacca with about 1,200 men and those times was an army um, and about 18 ships. He sailed to Malacca and insisted that the Sultan allows him to build a fort at the port of Malacca. The Sultan of Malacca refused those demands and there was a fight um, at the port for about 40 days. The port then at that time fell um, and on August 24th, 1511, became a Portuguese, uh, became part of the Portuguese empire. Um, that day, was in fact the very first incident that a Eastern port or town became colonized. It was a mark, it was the, a, a mark on history that has changed directions for a lot of things. 
that was the very first incident of the Western colonization of the East. From that point onwards, the Spanish came, um, the Dutch came, and the British came as well. But the Port of Malacca, uh, the Portuguese conquering the Port of Malacca was the very first one, and it was over spices. And not only that, there was another major incident that now has moved a whole different, that has moved the time from the Middle Ages or the medieval, medieval era to a whole different era. At that time when the Port of Malacca was, being, uh, was conquered, the Portuguese controlled the port for 160 years. And within those 160 years has expanded international trading to the way that we know today, where it's global and it was international trading by sea route. And, and that was the point where the Middle Ages and the medieval, medieval era move to the modern ages that we know of today. And it was that incident and the spice trade that propelled that need to move that era to this kind of globalized world. And, and that was what was very interesting. So um, having, having said that, um, spices and cloves, um, after that, in the entire region, um, uh, in my very last slide, um, continues to become incorporated um, on our, just in our everyday lives, all over our Southeast Asian cuisine, even without even, without even thinking about it, right? Because it's not it's not something that we um, uh, it's not something it, it, while while. Uh, in, in the middle of the time, it was something that it was so pricey and, and, and difficult to get access to in the West. Um, today, over this you know, number of uh, period in Southeast Asia, there, there has always been easy access to clothes that it became part of everyday life that we know of today. And, and it has influenced the entire array of Southeast Asian cuisine that you see on this slide, uh, where you would see dishes from um, the Chinese Peking duck. It actually has cloves in it because it uses five spice powder and that incorporated cloves is one of the ingredients within a spi five spice blend or most of the spi five spice blends in, in that Peking duck. Uh, and in Indian cuisine, um, in our curries, you would often see uses of cloves in different varieties of curries. Um, and uh, of course, in Malaysian cuisines where we have uh, the local curries, it's the local way of uh, you know, uh, just incorporating a number of gingers and cloves together to create the, the local uh, Southeast Asian style curry. And, and of course, you know, in a lot of Chinese cuisine, um, every time you see seasoning uh, or Chinese barbecue seasoning, there is always star anise and cloves in some of the seasonings that, that's being used. So you see that Pretty, pretty much in, infused into every kind of Southeast Asian flavors without even knowing it, it's, it's part of the spice pack. So that was, um, that was what life was during those times. And that was how cloves um, changed history and also was incorporated into our daily lives today, even before, you know, even without us realizing how, how much that impact was. Thank you so much, Angie. You really gave us so much to think about. And I'm sure that during the Q&A, people will have questions. If folks actually want to start dropping questions in the chat um, as Dot gets her slides together, I know that we'll be together here until 8.30. Uh, thank you again to both Marissa and Angie for sharing so much. Um, Actually, Angie, if you do want to take a look at this question, I'm just going to read it out loud. I'm curious about cloves and oxtails. In stew or soup, cloves are invariably an important ingredient. Is there any Eastern or medicinal reason for this or just coincidence? So I know Dot's going to have a chance to present, but Dot, uh, Angie, would you like to just give us a, a brief answer before we move to Dot? Yeah, so I think there are two different ways of um, looking at cloves and oxtail. 
So there is a recipe in the Southeast Asian region that incorporates cloves and oxtail. fact, from the port of Malacca, there is a Christang dish um, called the oxtail stew. Uh, and the oxtail stew, the Christang cuisine is a combination of cuisine um, that combine the uh, Portuguese ingredients with the local spices that was available in the region. And, you know, back, back in the 1400s, when trade had to happen, it was not a money exchange. It was an ingredient exchange. And when you exchange ingredients, especially when it's, you know, food uh, ingredients like this, the main thing that um, needs to happen is, is to teach people how to use it. So at the Port of Malacca, a lot of recipes started to be created because they had to combine ingredients and use it. So the Portuguese brought things like potatoes and tomatoes. Um, they brought tomato seeds and they planted them. So tomatoes were available in Malaysia because it was brought by the Western world. And we had um, cloves and ginger. So there was this oxtail stew, the Christian oxtail stew incorporated both these ingredients together. So it's almost like a Portuguese stew with um, cloves and spices in it. And that was one way um, that it was being uh, used and created. The other method was, um, if you look at the Chinese recipe, uh, oxtail soup recipe that has cloves, the anise and, and um, cinnamon, that was more uh, from the herbal medicine standpoint. It's very similar to the earlier picture of Bakute uh, that I showed you. Uh, when when um, good pork bones are not available, oxtail was a cheap ingredient, a much cheaper ingredient that people could have access to. And you would be able to create a similar herbal broth using clove star anise and cinnamon. And that was considered medicinal. So you would drink that uh, for health. So different um, cultures within that region has used the combination of cloves and oxtail for two different purposes. Thank you so much, Andy. And I know we're gonna be getting more questions. Um, so we'll just keep track of those. And in the meantime, Dot's gonna bring us back to the exhibit. Take it away, Dot. All right, so um, I only wanna speak for a few minutes. And what I wanna do is I hope compliment uh, a little bit what Marissa and Angie have been saying with just showing you a few of the objects um, from, from the collections, not necessarily from the exhibition, uh, but one of the great things about being virtual is that I don't have to just show you what's in the exhibition, I can show you anything I want to. So I forgot to show you um, earlier, I was just talking, but here's the Biblioteca Philadelphiensis uh, project and Susanna has some links that she's going to be dropping as I'm talking. So if you want to know more about the manuscript digitization project, there will be a link. And I just have a couple of, of photos of the gallery um, as well, uh, just to say again, like how gorgeous it looks. So here's the gallery looking from um, the door and then a little bit closer. Um, and then there is this uh, online exhibition. Um, so if you want to find out a little more and see a few of the things that are in the exhibition, it's there. So um, I wanna start by looking at um, a, a few objects that are in the section of for labor. Um, and it might not be surprising that there are um, items uh, having to do with cooking in the labor section because cooking in the middle ages was quite, um, quite a labor. It was labor intensive, you didn't have toaster ovens, you had to, to, to cook uh, on an, in an open, open fire. Um, and so one of the ways that we can really see um, how cooking, at least in some respects, was, was presented in the Middle Ages is through books of hours. Um, books of hours were uh, very popular um, prayer books that were owned by people in the middle class and in the upper classes. Um, this was, of course, the, the, the main religion in Western Europe was Christianity and the, the church was very important and people uh, like to sort of show how, um, how uh, Christian they were, right? How, how they followed the religion. And so they would have prayer books that they had uh, kept often very beautiful that they would use to pray throughout the day 
And that's where we get the name Book of Hours because you have prayers that you say during the hours, different hours of the day. Um, Books of Hours um, mostly, usually had at the very beginning um, a calendar. Um, and it's a little bit different from a calendar that you think of that maybe you have one hanging on the wall or you have a work calendar where you sort of schedule your day and your week and your holidays. Um, a uh, calendar in a book of hours and it really in any other um, medieval manuscript was a sort of chart of the church year. So you would use the book of hours to know on what days you prayed to specific saints or you celebrated specific days. So, and we have remnants of this, right? So we have Christmas day, but they also had Christmas day in their calendars, but they had a lot of other, a lot of other days too. And so within the, within the calendar, every month would get uh, usually two pages. So the calendar would be 12 pages long because you have, or sorry, tw um, one for each page. So it would be 12 pages long, one page for each month, uh, sometimes 24 because sometimes they'd be longer. Um, and the months were decorated um, often with um, zodiac signs and also with what they called the labors of the month. And so every month had a labor assigned to it. And the labor might, um, you might have different labors depending on where you are. So a book of hours um, that was made in, um, in Italy, in Southern Italy, uh, might have a different uh, labor of the month for December or maybe September than something made in the North because it's warmer in the South. And so they vary from place to place, uh, but usually they were, um, they were sort of presented. And one of very common labors of the month was baking bread. Uh, so we have, um, these are just from a few of the Lewis uh, manuscripts, which are from the free library uh, the one on the upper right is from the, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And then the one below that is MS Codex 1056. That's a manuscript from Penn. Uh, and these are all illustrating uh, bread baking um, in, in different ways. You can see the one in the middle on the bottom has a very open flame. And then the ones, the other ones look more like stoves. And if you've ever been to, um, to sort of a fancy pizza restaurant, it looks like the stove that you see uh, baking pizza. So very much like that, like open with a fire in it. And, um, and when, when Marissa was talking about the bread baking, these are the, exactly the kinds of ovens that those, um, those cakes would be baked in. They would bake the bread first. And then after the bread was baked, when the, when the, when this, when the oven was not quite so hot, then they would bake these little cakes. So that was sort of interesting. And this is what they look like. And I'm just going to sort of go through so you see in context um, what, what the calendars look like. And you can see the other um, uh, labors uh, presented here and the zodiac. So you can see the zodiac sign over on the other side um, through there. And here, this is uh, going to be, this is the December one. And so we even have a prayer starting on the, on the other page um, and here, and there we go. There's our last, our last one. And then these, I wanna show these just because these are, these are very special. These are calendar leaves that are from the hours of um, Louis the 12th. And these, this was a manuscript that was actually taken apart um, in the, I think 16th or 17th century. It was, take, it, was, it was taken apart not very long after it was made. And there are leaves that are all over the world. And four of them happen to be at the free library. And one of the four happens to be um, not baking bread. But if you look on the far left, he is, he is above baking bread. He is standing by a fire and waiting to feast. That is, that is his labor. I want to call it a labor there. Um, this is a shot from the from the in the wall of the gallery. So you can see the four leaves um, on the on the right, and then there are some uh, manuscripts um, in the in the in the table that you can't really see. But those are all books of hours that are also showing labors. And then over on the left, you can see that there is something else hanging on the wall. And then there's a Metropolitan Bakery menu hanging on the wall. Uh, Metropolitan Bakery is a local bakery in Philadelphia and among a lot of other things that they sell, they sell bread. And so we have the bread menu on the wall. So why do we have the bread menu on the wall in a medieval exhibition? 
uh, well, as before I was talking about how we're trying to sort of bring the Middle Ages a little bit closer. So this um, item that's hanging on the wall is uh, an assize of all manner of bread. So this was actually a, a, a document sort of documenting by law um, how much uh, people should be paying for bread based on the kind of flour that uh, was used in the bread, the size of the loaves. Um, and here's a, here's a little bit closer. So each column is a different uh, type of flour sizes and then the price. So if um, you went to a baker and you were charged something other than this, baker could uh, trouble and go to, they're overcharging you uh, for that. So um, the, you know, metropolitan bread menu doesn't have quite the same um, strength of law behind it, but uh, it still tells you how much you're going to expect to pay for the bread when you go in. Um, so turning then to the natural world, so that was sort of the labor of baking and cooking. Um, and this is more about the recipe side. So you've already seen, Marissa has already shown you some of this, so, um, but I just want to show you a little bit more. So this is um, another one of our manuscripts. This is uh, a manuscript from Penn, um, LJS. 458. Um, similar to the, uh, to the other manuscript uh, that Marissa showed you and that she talked about a little bit, it is a miscellany in the sense that it's a, it's a recipe book, uh, but it has med medical recipes mixed up, mixed up with culinary recipes. So here, um, I am very rusty, but I think this is a, there's a recipe for sort of a mustard and whether that's culinary mustard or some kind of medicinal mustard, I don't actually uh, know. And, but then there's a bread, sort of a bread recipe uh, here. Um, so again, sort of the, the mixing of the, of the recipes. Um, and then here's our friend MS Codex uh, 823, um, this commonplace book and recipe book. And these are the same pages that, um, that Marissa showed us earlier. So the, the, um, the recipe, uh, recipes there. Um, and this is, um, I didn't know exactly what Angie was going to be talking about, but I feel like these uh, sort of reflect another side of what she was talking about. So these are ledgers um, from the University of Pennsylvania. They're all 16th century um, ledgers. So containing, um, entries from the through the 1500s and they're all from Italy two of them are from Florence and they include payments made uh, to all sorts of dealers but including spice dealers so here we have evidence um, manuscripts in collections in Philadelphia of the spice trade from the European side specifically from the Italian side so um, here is here are examples these are receipts so a spice trader would come um, sell however much spice and then they would take this book out and the trader would actually write out, here's what I'm selling you, here is the amount of money that I received and then they would sign it. So these, this is how um, that historical information to us is through, through books like, like this one. Uh, so that's all I have to show you. Um, so it's always sort of interesting to think about how, you know, we have um, things that we know because of the books that people wrote in the Middle Ages and the information they left. We have Marissa making uh, recipes, uh, you know, baking recipes based on them. And then Angie is able to do her research based on what we're left. And it's always sort of interesting to think about what are people, you know, 500 years ago going to, how are they going to know about us. That's just a suggested thing, but I think there are a lot of questions, so I'm going to stop uh, talking, but thank you very much. And thank you, Dot. So I noticed, and I love this, our chat is very active. I encourage you to continue to add questions and comments, but I have a couple of notes here, um, and I'm just going to sort of toss it over to our panelists, and anyone else can chime in. Um, and there was a question about the dates for some of the 
documents, the manuscripts that you were sharing, Dot, could you give us a little bit of information? I'll also preface this by saying that I was able to share the links that Dot had sent to me so that um, you all can click on those links and you'll see the digitized manuscripts that will have further information. Yes, so the three ledgers that I showed at the end are all from the 1500s. So from the late, sort of from the later, the later 1500s, even into the 1600s, which is quite, which is quite late. Um, the books of hours, I'm looking for the, um, so the books of hours would all be, I don't, I don't have the dates here, but they'd all be from the, like 1450 through 1550. From, a, from around there. But if you click, if you click the links, you'll see exact, more or less exact dates. They're not, you can't always date them exactly, but more or less exact. And the differences in the way they look is, um, is sometimes dependent on the time, the time that they were written, but also where they were, where they were made. So the more sort of fancier, prettier ones are more likely to be from France or from Italy. And the not so pretty ones are more likely to be from also France, but England, just because that's how it is. And the calendar leaves, the four calendar leaves, that book of hours was circa 15 from Tour from France. So that's a very fancy French manuscript. And I think that was all, that was all the manuscripts. We don't actually have a lot of very early manuscripts in, um, in Philadelphia collections. And the ones that we have aren't very, um, pretty always, and they're not, there wasn't really anything that was suited to this, but a lot of what was sort of relevant to this conversation was sort of later. Thank you, and sort of a related question, I think also based on some of the book of hours images that we saw, there was a question around bread making and um, was there usually a connection to the month of December? Yes, it was usually the month of December that Great. was um, that was bread baking because it's because it's a warm, you know, it's something that gets you inside and it's warm. Great. Um, and there was a question about whether or not the ovens were usually shared or did each family tend to have their own ovens when bread baking. So I don't, I don't know. Marissa, do you know the answer to that question? I know that the kinds of elite households that created these manuscripts and documents about their lives, they would have a hearth stove and the um, produce of that stove would feed the, um, the head of the house and also all of the people who were in service as servants in that household. So it would feed across the economic spectrum in that kind of household. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I would expect that people who lived in, in cottages would have their own fire, but it wouldn't be a big, it would be a small, much smaller affair, I think, than, than that. And then um, there was a question about an image that Dot showed with a person in a barrel of red stuff and our 11 year old who's joining us this evening wants to know what is going on there. Okay, so I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna reshare it because I think I know what you're talking about. Um, oh, I didn't reshare, hold on. Ah, okay. Um, so I will, because it's worth, it's worth looking at because it is kind of fun. Um, so back to, if I am understanding correctly, this one here. So this is, oop, um, so the far right, this is making uh, wine. So this is, they've filled the, the, the sort of barrel with uh, grapes. And now this person is stepping on the grapes to get the juice out. And then they'll collect the juice and put it into barrels so it can be aged to, to be made into wine. And that's um, a typical month for the month of September. Um, not in every, again, not everywhere, but, um, but in tour than, than this was. And I'll just quickly say what the other ones are. Uh, so the one on the far left, um, this, is, this is actually February. Um, this is warming oneself by the fire and preparing to feast. 
The next one is uh, mowing hay, and that's for the month of June. And then next is winnowing grain that is separating. So separating the wheat from the chaff, putting the grain in and separating it. And that's for the month of August. And these are just the four that we have. So it may be that someone else has the has December and maybe it does have baking bread. I, I don't really know, but it's possible. Thank you, Dot. And sure. to be a good question for you, Angie, there was a, a question from the audience about using cloves and sort of like, is the entire clove used? Is there a portion that's not used, um, including when it's ground? Could you tell us more about that? So, yeah, so the cloves is actually, um, so in the clove flower, you would see a bunch of cloves in the flower itself. So the clove is actually the seed of it. You would use the entire clove, including that little ball and a tiny stem, and we would grind the whole thing. Yes, that is the entire clove, the one that Marissa is uh, picking up. So each one of that comes from a little flower bud, and, and in, in the clove tree, it's actually a bunch of cloves like that. Thank you, Angie. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, my first recollection around cloves was when I was maybe seven years old and my mom showed me how to take a fresh orange and make a design with whole cloves. And I actually did that with my children recently who are just about the same age now as I was then. And it's a really fun, very sensory experience. And then I didn't pull it, but it is in my kitchen. Um, oftentimes the way it ends up working is that that entire orange with the cloves will fully dry into this hard ball. And I think it actually, that tradition originates in the same medieval period as well. Mar Marissa and I had a discussion about that just last week. <laughs> I had the same question because as a kid, I used to read English literature and learn about the pomander. That is, that did not come from Southeast Asia. There was nothing like that in Asia. Nobody knows what a pomander is, but we read that in literature books. And I've always been very curious how that came about. And I asked Marissa that question and what, and you discovered something about it. Yeah, Marissa. Well, I think the two of us were, were trying to figure it out and realize that it had a lot of religious associations um, yeah. in the period. But uh, one of the things I was talking about was how the, um, the scent of the orange and the clove there, you have both of them combined and it's supposed to be um, a healthful thing to um, surround yourself in sweet and, and um, positive smells um, to both um, just, you know, have a nice experience, but also to prevent you from encountering contagion. And it's the idea that by controlling the air around you, you could avoid um, becoming ill from contagions that were, um, that we would now call airborne contagions, but they didn't fully, they had a concept of miasma, but not of um, airborne contagion in exactly the same way. So the pomander, is beautiful and it smells good and it dries out, but it also fits into these um, health and disease uh, uh, conversations as well as into religious concerns. And it was it was something that the priests would have as a religious symbol at that time, during the medieval times. That's so interesting. That is really interesting. Angie, we have another question for you. Um, Lisa would like to know a little bit more about your research experiences and how you came to do this historical work. And she just mentioned she doesn't know a lot of people who are both chefs and also people that are actively studying history. Um, so my passion has always been traditional food. In, in, and in fact, in my restaurant, if many of you have come into my restaurant before, I talk about the food that I serve and the history behind it, how it uh, came about. Uh, but a lot of it is, is history uh, from just the place that I grew up in. I, I can't say that I'm an expert in all Asian history, but definitely from the spice islands and the spice region that I grew up in, we, uh, we were exposed to a lot of traditions and history that continued up to today's lifestyle. And a lot of it has been passed down 
um, from uh, for generations. So a lot of a lot of this history is now currently being recaptured again, um, and and the work that I do uh, with food. Um, goes back to this current generation of us just trying to recapture generations and generations of just verbal passing down of food and recipes that has rarely been documented in the entire region. Um, so one of my goals and my passion is just to continue to uh, research and document as much as possible before the elder generation passes away because a lot of these things are just retained by the people, um, the older people that that are still around, and and uh, just it's just in your heads, you know. So we have to try to capture that as much as we can right now. Thank you, Angie, and thank you for doing this work. And I think for for those of you that are on the call tonight, if you are interested in following other chefs here in Philadelphia and you know, nationally, internationally who are doing this work, I can definitely follow up with additional recommendations um, because this is definitely of interest to us. And I, I would imagine Marissa also has some suggestions. Um, I'm just wanting to give a few more minutes to q and I love how many questions people have. Um, how many contemporary recipes call for a clove studded onion? How far back and from where did this practice originate I've seen this in French cooking, especially. I don't think I can answer that question because I don't think we have clove studded onions in the Southeast Asian region as much. We do use both in combination, uh, but but we don't we don't start it. So the way that the Southeast Asian recipes would start off is typically to um, caramelize the onion in oil and then also caramelize the, uh, not caramelize, but render the cloves in oil. So the key technique in the Southeast Asian region is about tempering the oil because oil is a carrier of fragrance and that's how perfume is being made. That is also the essential way of starting a Southeast Asian uh, recipe or spice is to temper the oil with the spices before you add your other ingredients in it. So, so um, the French method of studying the onion, I'm not sure who started that, but it, it, I don't think it started in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add? I mean, I would just say that around um, 1800, when I, uh, which is where my historical knowledge of food kind of cuts off, um, that's when French cuisine is transforming to the um, pure flavors, the layered sauces, the um, trying to taste the uh, the chickens, chickeniness, and the mushrooms, mushroominess, essential qualities, and moving away from some of the spiciness that. Um, had dominated uh, European cuisine for generations in, um, and, and has a direct connection to the recipes that Andrew's talking about and the um, recipes that I've been looking at in the, in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, so I don't actually know where the onion studded with cloves um, comes from in that, in that tradition, but it, it, it seems to um, maybe be a, a, a more recent, maybe 20th century um, uh, thing as opposed to something connect that, that like kind of circles back to these earlier traditions. <laughs> Judy, um, who's in the audience tonight, just shared, and I love this because I, I think about this a lot when cooking. Um, she writes, I always thought sticking the cloves in an onion made it easier to fish out later, which, you know, I appreciate that as someone who's often like cooking and then dealing with like, who's going to find the bay leaf, who's going to find the whole spice I put in there if that's something that's maybe um, not a desired trait of the finished dish. So that could also be very well where it's coming from. And I think, you know, we had another participant share that this is really a talk that touches on food, culture, and history. And that's, that's absolutely right. You know, I think there's so many traditions, as Angie was mentioning, that are ones that we're personally familiar with that maybe don't um, have a whole lot of historical record that goes with it, or maybe we haven't quite done that research yet. And so I think there is a real opportunity to think about sort of like, what were those traditions that 
were passed down to you and then how does that fit into this global global narrative around uh, cuisine and sort of how we come to know these spices as as familiar in, in their own way. Angie, did you have something to share? Oh no, I, this is oh. this is a great opportunity um, for me to just talk about the you know my passion around food culture and history and especially coming from a region as like halfway around the world from here um it's it's less known here but it's definitely you know uh, a, a pretty big impact to the way the world is today and and the way our every life is everyday life is yeah Thank you so much. So I'm just answering one final question. I know we're right at 830. So I want to make sure that that we wrap up so that folks can enjoy their cookies and maybe their dinner. Um, uh, Donna asks, is this presentation part of a series and are there other presentations scheduled? So in line with the medieval exhibit, um, medieval life exhibit, having been slated to be open physically through the end of January, um, we are continuing our virtual programming series also through the end of January 2021. And if you go to freelibrary.org um, and click on our virtual programming link, you'll be able to see all of the programs that I currently have listed under Medieval Life. If you just do a keyword search or look for that tag. Um, and so we have a museum, uh, I'm sorry, a music program that will be culminating the series at the end of January, but then leading up to that, we have, thank you, Dot, for sharing that link. Um, we have later this month, actually, uh, coinciding with winter break, we have a hands-on program um, that is family friendly, that is allowing everyone to create a paper astrolabe. And if you wanna know more about that, you'll have to join us in the interest of time. And then uh, we also have a set of roundtable discussions that we're putting together for mid-January that's going to um, really touch on really key important aspects of who and how we're studying the Middle Ages right now. Um, so again, Dot's dropping some of the programming links and then there are two additional programs that will happen mid-January that are going to be going up. Um, and I just want to take this opportunity again to thank everyone that joined us this evening, to thank all of our panelists. This was fantastic. Um, and I encourage all of you, if you haven't had a chance yet, to visit the Medieval Life exhibit online and stay in touch and join us for additional programs. So thank you again, and I hope to see you all soon. Have a wonderful night.